Good morning and aloha everyone. Welcome to Law Across the Sea. Uh, my name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. And today our program is titled China Briefing. And my guests are Brenda Foster and Larry Foster. I've known the Fosters for quite a few years. They have a depth of experience and great expertise concerning the events that have shaped present day China. We're privileged to have them. Brenda, among her many past and current titles, is the former president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, which is one of the largest chambers of commerce in the world. And she's presently the head of an international consulting firm that assists Asia-Pacific companies invest in the United States. Larry is the former dean of the UH Law School and continues to teach law in Hawaii and China. And he's recently published a book on the language of Chinese law. I've asked them to brief us on China's current status and out outlook in the world. And I want to welcome them. Thank you very much, both of you, for yeah. being here. Aloha. Good to see you, Mark. Aloha. 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 Um, I know that you went to China, both of you, many years ago. When, when was that? And and what was China like in those days? As we, and then I'd like to move up a little bit and talk about the current events in China and where we are today and, and what's going on because we don't hear a lot about China due to a lot of domestic press in the United States now. So what, wh what was China like when you first went? Well, I first went to China in 1978. I led a delegation of Pacific and Asian Affairs Council high school students together with a delegation from the University of Hawaii. And we were invited to China in June, and we were six months ahead of when the U.S. normalized relations with wow. China. So we visited Guangzhou, Shanghai, Beijing, and it was just fascinating to actually be there and be in China before it actually opened up to the West. And did you have expectations of what it was going to be like and what was it like? Um, the expectations would have been from having studied Chinese language and literature uh, for eight years at the University of Washington and also having studied uh, for a year in Taiwan. So I had images of uh, classical poetry and uh, scenery and a lot of the history of China. When I went there, it was absolutely fascinating uh, because so much of the people there had not seen foreigners in, since 1940. Uh, they were very curious. They engaged just wonderfully with our high school students who would sing songs from Hawaii and talk with everybody. We hiked up into the mountains to tea villages, sat and talked with people. So for me, it brought everything I had studied in college and for my degrees to life. And it was just wonderful uh, uh, to see it that way. And L Larry, how about you? When was your first time in China and, and what, what was it like? Yeah, uh, let, let me back up a few years okay. before that, uh, 10 years before that. Uh, we, uh, uh, 1978, 1968. 68. 1968, there's a decade earlier. We uh, 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 went to Taiwan for the summer. You, you and Brenda? Yeah, okay. uh, to do language study. I uh, see. Uh, that's, that's actually where, where we really first got to know each other. Uh, uh, so uh, when we left Taiwan to come back to Hawaii, we stopped in Hong Kong. And when we were in Hong Kong, we went up to the border and looked across the border to uh, the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's all you could do at that time. As couldn't, a, couldn't get across. Uh, Americans were, were... Did you what, try? Uh, no, <laughs> did not try, fortunately. <laughs> Uh, but but our, our government was not keen on Americans going, and their government was not keen on, on foreigners coming into China. Mm -hmm. So you could go to the sort of lookout place and look across and see all these paddy fields, and, and occasionally you see someone working in the paddy field. Not a, not a developed country? Not a developed at all, no. Uh, I first made it to the, the People's Republic of China, then I think I went with Brenda on a trip in, in the early 80s. It was 81, 82, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, China was still uh, very un undeveloped at, at, at that time. Uh, Economically, commercially, e I mean, every, everything. Everything. Uh, mm. so, so, so let's talk about commercially, for example. So, uh, in, uh, let me go back to 1978. Mm -hmm. uh, 
there, there was uh, the head of China then, Deng Xiaoping, mm. was the one who, quote unquote, opened China. And uh, uh, so there was a grand opening of, uh, of, of, of China at, the, at that time. Uh, and that was sort of the beginnings of uh, the opportunity for the people in China to develop a private economy. Because under communist rule, there was no private economy. So in the years, when, when I first got to, to China in 1980 or 81, uh, there was little, if any, private economy. Uh, we stayed at, at, at joint venture hotels. Uh, th there were no shops, certain shops that foreigners could go to, and there were very little shops, if any, that, that the locals could go to. Uh, uh, we were not allowed to use Chinese currency. We had to use a special kind of currency that was developed just for foreigners really? to, to use. Okay. Uh, and we could go to the friendship store uh, and use this currency at the friendship store. Uh, uh, that currency was very valuable in some ways in that the local people uh, only had local currency, so they were very eager to get this special currency so they could go to the friendship and store. And use it mm -hmm. to buy goods that they couldn't n normally get. I yes. Guess. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Right. So as, as you go, uh, occasionally, I can remember going into some of the department stores in Beijing and, and Shanghai and just empty shelf after empty shelf mm. of stuff. Very, very few things. Simple things. You know, you know uh, cooking utensils, bedding, something like that, but, but very, very little on the shelves. Uh, and if you went to the friendship store, you could get fancy foods and all these kinds of, uh, all these kinds of things. So, so part, of the, part of the story of the changing China is this development of the private economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and one way to see the, the symbol of that is neon lights. Uh, uh, Shanghai was the first to get neon lights. Uh, and I forget when, when, when we first noticed yeah. that, but maybe in the mid, mid 80s to, uh, maybe around the mid 80s, uh, that uh, uh, the private economy was coming. Uh, there, there, there were restaurants that you could go to, shops, advertising, stores, marketing. advertising. Uh, so Beijing was still a dark city, uh, but Shanghai was uh, hmm. starting to get lit up. So hmm. as you flew into Shanghai or drove uh, from the airport in, in, into downtown Shanghai, uh, you would see these these lights and stuff of the private economy uh, coming Developing. coming forward. Yeah, yeah, because as Larry said too, I mean the fruits there wasn't a lot of fruit or vegetables. Everything was seasonal. So depending on the time of the year you were in China in those days, that you'd only see cabbage or watermelon. Uh, most of the Chinese had to use ration coupons to stand in line uh, for meat, for rice, this sort of thing. So on my very first trip in 78, we stayed in an army barracks wow. uh, off the Bund. Uh, there was only one other hotel, and I think it was the Peace Hotel uh, at that time. Oh, and a Friendship Hotel, I believe. But we were in the army barracks. In, this was in Shanghai? In Shanghai. Hmm. We were in an army barracks off the Bund. And, and, and you, uh, you, you folks were way ahead of the curve on this, it, it seems to me. I mean, because you were th there before uh, Kissinger went, isn't that right? Or, uh, or, after, after Kissinger. After. No, I was there before Kissinger yeah. went. And uh, Kissinger had been doing some of the initial shuttle diplomacy, but I was there in June, and they didn't normalize relations until wow. December of that of 1978. I mean, that, that actually sounds like a story in itself, how you got there. Um, and you, you were with a bunch of kids we from had Hawaii. A we, had high we took high school students. Actually, the trip was arranged wow. uh, by the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association. And the fact that Hawaii had had a long-standing relationship with China right. enabled uh, Hawaii to be given an invitation by the Chinese uh, to bring a delegation in as part of the initial people-to-people -people diplomacy that was being initiated between the United States and China leading up to normalization. Well, you, you know, and when you talk about that, it sounds to me like Hawaii had a big advantage. Uh, I mean, I, I, that's the first I've heard about that trip. Mm -hmm. And and it sounds like that connection between China and Hawaii is something that we could use or we could take advantage of, if you will. It was a long-standing relationship going back to the fact that Dr. Sun Yat-sen had lived here twice, had gone to school here, had raised funds uh, for the revolution prior to, you know, right. the establishment of the People's Republic of China. This was back in the early 1900s and mm -hmm. 20s. But also over the years, there were several families here in Hawaii that had relatives still 
uh, in China and they were able through various means to be able to stay in contact with them and also through a travel agency here run by I believe it was Koji Ariyoshi uh, they were starting to work on developing relations and get in on the ground floor so Hawaii had a distinct advantage over many of the other states uh, to be able to establish this relationship. There was a lot of aloha, and there still is, in China for Hawaiian mm -hmm. people from Hawaii. I've noticed that, too, in, in my travels in China. So uh, the time you went there, the first time, it, things were not developed. There were, uh, it was more of a, a working class, if you will, uh, type of society is that, is that right in my, my per perception yes right? everybody wore mild suits it was what I called blue black or gray mm. that was what everybody wore uh, all you know very much mouse type suits uh, very industrious except Shanghai Shanghai <laughs> underneath at that time had a little bit of uh, vibrancy uh, there was some color in Shanghai and there was just a whole different feel about Shanghai, actually, than there was with uh, Guangzhou or Beijing. Okay, well, let, let's move to Shanghai. You actually went there. You, you both lived there for seven years? Eight. Eight, eight years. When, when did that start, and how did that get going? How, how was that, and what was China like then? I mean, what, what, what year was that? 2005. Okay. We lived there from 2005 to uh, 2013. And had there been much of a change in that period of time since your first encounter with China, uh, being on the ground in China? Oh, there'd been a dramatic change. I mean, you had a tremendous amount of foreign direct investment into China. You had high-rise buildings. You had bridges. You had freeways. Um, it was just very much a modern city. You could still walk around Shanghai and see, you know, traces of the old Shanghai, you know, in the alleys in the back or various homes. Uh, but there was a thriving economy, uh, and there was a big private economy that was mm. run by what I would call the mom and pop stores or S. SMEs. Uh, it was very vibrant, and Shanghai always had this can-do attitude. They were always a little bit different than Beijing. Uh, Beijing was far more conservative because the national government was there, but Shanghai was always about commerce and always about business. And you were the head of the American Chamber of Commerce. Yes, I was at, the president of the American at, Chamber of Commerce there. Time. Larry, you were dean of the law school at that time, but you were going. No, I was. I was a professor at, the, at, oh, okay. at, at that time. Oh, okay. I I'd stepped down as dean. Okay. So, so Brenda moved out there in 2005, and we 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 set up an arrangement, in my, and the university was very generous to me, where I would teach at UH in the fall, mm -hmm. and then from January to August, I would be in Shanghai with uh, with with Brenda. Uh, so when I first went out there. Uh, I was looking for employment, mm -hmm. and uh, I started working at a uh, Chinese uh, international law firm uh, in, uh, in 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 Shanghai. Okay, and what you know, before we go on our break, give me a little bit of a, a brief on what China was like to you as a law professor. What did you see that was different or new or or had changed since your your fir first encounter? Yeah, well, I think uh, I think Brenda's touched on this already, but really just the, uh, the uh, development of, of, of the private economy, uh, the development of uh, infrastructure. When, when, when we arrived in, in Shanghai in 2005, there were two subway lines, number one and the brand new number two. Uh, when we left in 2013, they were finishing line number 18. Uh, so, so, so just amazing infrastructure and the freeways and high-speed trains and all of this. Okay, and let's take the subway through our break and then we're, when we come back we'll talk about what's happening now and tell me a little bit about the current prospects for China. Okay, thank you. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to youtube.com and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Olelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha, I'm Richard Emery. I'm with co-host Jane Sugimura of Condo Insider, Hawaii's weekly show about association living. The uh, purpose of these videos is to educate board members and condo residents about issues uh, relating uh, to association living. Uh, we hope they're helpful and uh, that they uh, assist in resolving uh, problems that uh, affect the relationship uh, between boards and their residents. 
Each week, Thursday at 3 p.m., we bring you exciting guests, industry experts, who for free will share their advice about how to make your association a better place to live and answer a lot of very interesting questions. Aloha. We hope you'll tune in. We are back with uh, the Fosters, Brenda and Larry Foster, who have spent a good deal of their pr professional life in China. And we've talked a little bit about how they got there on this uh, journey. And now we're going to talk about what's happened in China. So, folks, Brenda, when were you last in China? And what was it like? And what has changed? What are things, what, what's going on in China? We were last in China in November. We were actually there for Thanksgiving. We had meetings uh, in Shanghai and actually Hong Kong also. So it was fun for us to be able to go back, uh, see everybody, talk with people, uh, assess the business environment, and actually a lot of the political environment and how the current political environment in Beijing might be impacting the business environment there. Uh, we had heard a lot of stories about uh, U.S. multinationals or o U.S. entrepreneurs going there and that business was getting more difficult to do in China. Difficult in what sense? Um, difficult in the sense that uh, there were more rules and regulations, uh, less transparency, much slower internet speed, and uh, it was becoming more difficult uh, to establish not only joint ventures and contracts, but just to be able to, to work in general. And, that, and that's on the Chinese side. Yes. The government side, yes. I, I should say, because I make a distinction between Chinese populace and, and the Chinese government. But so I'm hearing that the government is being more restrictive from the government. Or, or that's the impression you have. The impression I had, and especially in all of our meetings, uh, that in talking with people and in talking to uh, various companies representatives, was that it was becoming more difficult to do business there. Uh, so much, a lot of it, to dealt with the access of information, access of data. Well, I mean, let me ask you the dumb question: Why? 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 What, what, what's going on here? Because my experience with China has been that it's, it's moving forward at a rapid space, a pace, and that's what you told me before our break. And then now we've, we're at the, uh, now something's happened. Uh, economically, uh, China has been working very hard uh, to reach out globally. I mean, their establishment of their Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, uh, trying to bring various countries around the region uh, for their own version of TPP called RCEP. Uh, but what is happening domestically is a lot different. Uh, they're clamping down on the Internet. Uh, they're making it harder. Uh, for exporting and importing of goods and services. Uh, in terms of working with companies, uh, they're demanding much more access to proprietary information of foreign companies coming to work in China. And they're just trying to control their own domestic environment much closer, in spite of the fact that every holiday their populace travels all over the world and they have access either through VPNs to bypass what we used to call the Great China Firewall uh, and the rest. But I definitely noticed two things when we were there uh, different from when we lived there and were working there. One, one of my Chinese friends told me that when we lived there for those eight years, those are now considered the golden years hmm. and that they're gone and that they're not coming back. Uh, that's number one. Number two, there wasn't as much vibrancy. I noticed it with Larry. Uh, things Western, they are wanting to have more things domestically um, grown, so to speak, uh, not importing so many Western ideas and values, uh, but having it more, uh, how would I say this, come organically uh, in China. So uh, I saw very, very, very much a pullback on things Western. Now, are there restaurants and five-star hotels and things people could go to and do? Yes, all of that is there. Uh, the people are just as friendly. But I sensed a slowdown. I sensed a slowdown in the economy. I sensed a slowdown in terms of with the people, how far they were willing to venture out, what they were able to go. Um, but I have great faith in the Chinese people uh, in terms of what they're going to want to structure also uh, for their country, not just the policies that are impacting them coming down from Beijing. Larry, is that your, your impressions also? Is it 
your, your feelings? And, and it sounds to me, I mean, is this a party, uh, a, a communist party uh, movement? Or is this, a, I mean, is there a distinction uh, between the party and the government? Or uh, uh, the, Yeah, I'm, I'm not a political scientist, so I, I, won't, get, I won't get there. But uh, uh, what, I agree 100% with what Brenda is, is, is talking about. But there's really a just, just sort of a different, diff different sense and feel in China hmm. now. Um, the government really is trying to uh, uh, reassert the role of the party, reassert the, uh, the, uh, the role of the central government, and uh, be more controlled. Uh, one very small example of this is this concept uh, translated into English as, as social credit. Uh, everybody, every citizen in China has a file, hmm. and you have so many credits, social credits in that file. Hmm. And you can add to them by being a good citizen, or you can lose credits by being a poor citizen. Who, who keeps the file? The uh, the government. I see. Uh, I see. The government. Okay. And I, don't, I can't remember which which agency. Maybe public security. Right. Uh, but but it's very much a clampdown. Uh, you know, you talk about the uh, the internet. Uh, uh, you know, one of the big stories of, of China while we were there was the rise of, of social media. Uh, right. Uh, we were there just before the Olympics, and there was a big earthquake out, out in western China. Uh, the government tried to hide uh, all the damage, uh, but there were bloggers who were out there with their cameras and posting stuff on their blogs, and the government was trying to control that information, uh, uh, unsuccessfully as it turned out. Mm -hmm. uh, and now the internet really has really exploded in China. There are more internet users in China than population in the United States, uh, 400, 500, 600 million people uh, on the internet in China. Um, they have their own social media stuff. And the uh, government is very concerned about controlling social media. Uh, so each social media account has to be tied to your uh, citizen identity card um, so that they know who is saying what about whom, uh, so that they, hmm. can, they can shut down uh, Various sites or, or social media accounts uh, should that should that be necessary? Uh, it's a real it's a real clampdown politically, culturally, economically, uh, what have you. Well, Let, oh, based upon me. what what you told me, the the golden period, uh, I I I was there, and I saw that, and now what you're telling me is very surprising to me. What I would add is, you know, f up until recently, actually, Xi Jinping taking over. Um, one saw, you know, a really vibrant economy, but along with that vibrant economy in China was a lot of uh, corruption uh, in the Chinese economy. And one could call it corruption, one could call it the cultural aspects of doing business in China, uh, on paying favors or taking care of your friends, this sort of thing. And there were several, you know, very well publicized international cases right. on the corruption that was taking place in China. And one of the things when Xi Jinping came to power, he said, corruption can ruin the party. So I'm going to underscore what Larry said. For Xi Jinping and the current party leadership, the party is all-powerful, and mm -hmm. saving the party, keeping the party in power, it is what is paramount uh, to them. In doing so, there's been several purges, and they've been going after the corruption. But instead of doing it more according to a rule of law, though they like to see that they're using the law, you know, and developing more court systems and maybe something that we would see in a more different type of democratic process of a rule of law, um, they really are just throwing people in jail and, and mm -hmm. clamping down. Now, in doing so, China's always had this, you know, phenomenal entrepreneurial spirit, as right. I call it, and in doing business. But people are hesitant uh, to do business because they don't know now who's looking over their shoulder or watching. And I have heard stories of people I know who were at very high levels in the Chinese government who were not involved in any of the corruption scandals, but yet they have this self-criticism is back. Like Larry was talking about so, uh, social credit. They've now instituted in the various ministries, government, the rest, social criticism or self-criticism again. Actually, that is doing your own performance review. Mm -hmm. So as you do your own performance review, your colleagues might be looking over their shoulder and say, well, that's not true. They took a trip, and I don't know how they paid for that trip. So you see it pulling back. So for government officials to travel, they have to go through several hurdles to get uh, those trips approved. 
uh, they still are very much interested at the provincial level in terms of working uh, with Western companies, whether it be from the United States or Europe or wherever, because they want to develop it. A lot of the provincial areas still need that development. But in your larger cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, you'll see it pull back a lot. But you can do a lot more business in the provincial areas. But again, uh, you need to know who you're working with and what what the rules of the game are going to be. So uh, what I hear is that these changes are unintended consequences, if, to use a, a, a phrase, of trying to maintain the party control or maintain government control and avoid some bad aspects. And by doing that, you go one way, and sometimes the results are not what you anticipated. So that it doesn't doesn't sound like this was intended pullback. It's just an unintended consequence. No, I think it was intended oh, pullback okay. oh, okay. uh, because yeah. at the universities, professors can no longer access the internet to talk with their colleagues around the world oh, okay. uh, for research and the things that they're doing. People who had been fostering uh, relationships with uh, universities around the world are no longer able to do that. They want to organically grow everything at home. There's, uh, in the universities, there's curriculum reform to mm -hmm. uh, mm. re reinsert uh, party values and uh, uh, downplay Western uh, concepts of uh, things like democracy, uh, uh, what have you. So, so you each have friends that you've, you've left in China. I, 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 I know you've made friends there. Uh, and you've probably talked with them. And just generally, what, you know, what are they thinking? Where did, where are, what are they thinking about China? Where do they want it to go? What, do they, what are their hopes for their children? Their hopes for their children uh, are what any parent would have of their hopes for their children. They have an excellent education and a good job and a good life. They're, the people who can afford it very much want their children uh, to go to school abroad, starting even at the elementary school mm -hmm. level or secondary school level, not just university level. Uh, so they very much uh, want that. Um, but one other friend of mine said, when the cold wind from the north blows from Beijing, everybody bundles up in a blanket. Larry, you have a minute to tell okay. me uh, what you think about So the, the cold wind, so on, on, on the law reform side, uh, the term has come up now, sort of hi hibernation. The, uh, um, the, law, the law reformers have gone into hibernation. Uh, it is physically dangerous to uh, be advocating uh, 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 certain parts of uh, democracy and things like uh -huh. that in China. Okay. Well, look, I, I want to thank you both for giving us this update, and hopefully we can do it again sometime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our thank pleasure. You.